in the stuff. Uh, it isn't embedded in the frames of, that I get from uh, Sequence Generator Pro, and I just wondered if yours doesn't either. It doesn't fill them in. Now, I've never noticed before because I don't do photometry, but uh, now that I've started, uh, it does use image scale as one of its uh, things that it reads off of the FITS header. Oh, it, but it has the information necessary to calculate it. Uh, so it no, is... no, actually, it produces really weird uh, full width ha half maximum values unless you put the image scale in. So what, what I did was I took my frames and fill, just using the editor, I filled in what it should be. And then they came out to values that I would have expected. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I ran into that problem when you've got, like when you take a number of files and it doesn't contain one piece of information in the fits header. Right. And you can go one by one and change to something in the fits header. But if you've got 50 files to do that. Oh, I, I have software that will batch process them. Oh, OK. Yeah. As I say, I, as I say, I've never had to do it before because, uh, you know, for, you know, visual pictures, they, they don't really care most of the time. Don't care about image scale. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 you'd have to. Like, I'm surprised because SG Pro knows, like, you do tell it the focal length, and you do tell it mm. the pixel size. Uh, I, 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 I'll have to go through that again. You tell it the telescope mount, and you tell it all the other accessories, but I, I couldn't find a section where you tell it what telescope you have. Yeah, that's what I'm wondering if it doesn't know. I don't think it knows. I, I tried to find it. That's why I wanted to ask you, because I don't. Th I think you're the only other person that uses SGP that well, I know, it, anyways. It must know the the scale of the image to do the to do the plate solve. After you plate solve, but I, I, if you don't plate solve, I don't know if it would know. I know what you're saying. Like if you take a frame and it plate solves, then it would definitely know. Well, it has to know what it is to be before it plate solves. So it knows what index to go to. Hmm. Um, I think you can do wild and it just takes longer, but, uh, yeah. but, you're, but you're right. And you, you want to give it a hand. Yeah, I think um so it does know i'm just thinking if if it actually prints out i can start it up and have a look yeah if you don't mind having a look at one of your mono frames just just see if it has image scale uh set in it or whether it's blank or zero So Bill, I've been meaning to ask you something for a while. When are you going to become Bill with your real last name instead of Bill iPad? <laughs> when I remember. So yes, it will be. Where am I? Because it doesn't automatically do it. I have to change my name. I'm just poking you, that's all. That's all right. I just traveled eight hours from Kamloops to here just to be here with you guys. I arrived in the door 10 minutes ago. Good trip. It's a long ways from Kamloops to here. It is. Yes. Was it raining at all? No, nope, not at all. Not at all. It's great. But my son-in-law offered to let me build an observatory on his farm, which was interesting. Oh, does that mean you'll have a remote observatory there? Well, I went out and looked at the stars, and they were twinkling like mad. And I said to myself, 
I don't know if I want this or not. You know, I think Joe's, Joe, Joe and I have been talking about seeing in, in BC and uh, Victoria is the best there is apparently quite, and the what, the Southern Okanagan? Bill Weir, you know that. I think it's pretty good here. I don't know about the Southern Okanagan. I mean, there's lots of mountains, right? Yeah. Well, I guess if name? you're on the, if you're on the top, if you're on the top of one. Well, what's yeah, your name that has the fancy gear that took the picture of the nucleus of the latest comet and it was just totally awesome? It must Deborah Saravolo yeah. and Peter Saravolo. Yeah, it must be pretty good where they are. Yeah, they're in the Okanagan. Well, that's right on the U.S. border at um, Basilius and they're on Anarchist Mountain. And it's- Yeah, they're um, just a little further up the road from Jack Newton's place. Yeah, they're all in the same area. Kobo is in the same place too. <clears throat> Uh, it's across the valley. It's yeah, other side of the valley. Further west. Yeah. And the seeing there, as long as the wind's not blowing too hard, can be pretty good. Was that right? Oh. Yeah, I went to Cobalt Star Party about six years in a row. Yeah. Had some really, really good nights up there. Oh, how about that? Best views of Saturn I ever had were on Cobalt through Barry Arnold's 18 inch scope. Oh, wow. Like this stunning. <clears throat> I just find it highly, highly variable here. It's sort of like you get stunningly stable images some nights, and some nights it's just moving all over the place. So, yeah. David, on, on average, what do you think our seeing is here, do you think? David Lee probably knows better than me, right? Well, I, I've been looking at the full width half maximums, and I don't think I'm a good judge of that because I don't think my guiding's working properly, but I'm getting, I don't know, values of, uh, I don't know, seven, six, five, um, like really, really good is below two. Uh, common is like three to four. These are arc seconds? Yeah, arc seconds per pixel, I think, or something like that. Okay, so Dave, it is giving me the pixel scale. It's actually giving it to me twice, one with a keyword scale and one with a keyword pix scale. Uh, what about Im image scale? It's it's in the upper part of the uh, Fitz header. I don't have that one. Oh, I got image type, but that's the only thing that- No, 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 that, that wouldn't be it. Okay. Yeah. May I, maybe I need to look around. But, but mine has also spitting out the focal length. It's also spitting out the pixel size. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you, that's good. All that's all the information you need to know. Yeah, I must not be filling out a certain section of the yeah. profile. I'm wondering yeah, if, part of what if it, it doesn't know the focal length, then it doesn't give you any of those keywords. Yeah, if I didn't tell it, then it wouldn't know. Yeah. User error. <laughs> you did with me? Come on. That's not User possible. error. That's not possible. I just tell if it's good seeing by looking at some tight doubles. Yeah, you oh, could do yeah. that too. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. If you can't split the double double, then what's that? They're two arc seconds apart. Yeah. And well, you can easily do that on so many nights. Yeah. I've done sub arc second doubles of this way at Pearson and in my backyard. Hmm, really? But we're closer to the very tip of the island, right? So we're in a more unobstructed area. Victoria's in the just catching all that crap from the Malhat. Hmm. But does, you know what? Does, 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 the sea, mountains. does the sea help or hurt? In it's, theory, it's, it's well, supposed to stabilize. Yeah, it would help because there's nothing to bounce the air around over the sea. It's a constant. Depends on, it depends on your altitude. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't want to be in the marine air if you can avoid it. Yeah, I'd get up a couple hundred feet off the deck. <laughs> yeah, I always thought um, Bill's idea of going to those logging sites out at uh, Pass Shirley was a good idea up on the side of the mountain. 
Yeah, but the trees have grown up there. I've, I went up, I drove up that road last year coming back from mushroom picking and where I used to set up, the, all the scrub trees are all taller than I need to take out a chainsaw. Yeah. <laughs> Cut down all the trees that are like two inches in size now. The alders, you know, it's just a mat of alders in there now. Yeah, scrub. We'll just get started in a few moments. Welcome everyone. Um, at the moment I have Nathan and Margie on the list and we have some uh, photos from Edmonton. Does anybody else have anything? Uh, yeah, they just give me maybe five minutes. Uh, one for an, an announcement and one about progress on my AstroBerry server. Okay. Anybody else? <clears throat> uh, Bill, I, I've had a bite from a, a friend of mine in the fishing club who lives out in soup. And he's right. just starting to get interested in astronomy. So uh, I might point him your way. I told him I he may come this weekend to have a look at my scope and stuff, but uh, he's just kind of new. Uh, mm -hmm. So rather than have him drive all the way into Victoria to have a, a session with me, I might point him to you. <laughs> His name is Mohammed Dokrit. Okay. So he 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 may or may not show up on Zoom tonight. I sent him the link just in case. But apparently he started something new at work and he thought he might be a little bit late, so. And I'm still working on my Galileo telescope, looking at Jupiter project. I managed to get little holes. It's, it's moving so fast, I'm misjudging in my time. I have this little V in the trees where Jupiter cracks through. I have about 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> but it's moving so much. It's moving so much earlier in the evening. It's like it used to be okay. Anytime between 10 30 and 11, I'm good. Now it's like I looked out last night at 10 o'clock and I was like, oh man, I gotta go. <laughs> Run outside. Oh, grab hard to see shadow fans move in that time frame. <laughs> well, that's, that's hilarious because I'm in the exact same position. It's, exact it's, a one, same it's a one inch telescope. There is no time for like futzing around trying to even Bill, find. Bill, are you starting to feel like Galileo yet? <laughs> I'm, I'm 20, I'm one third of the way there. Okay. When I, when I look at his observation logs, it's like he did 64 observations and I've got 20 so far. Mm -hmm. And then I can't wait for like sort of the spring now because um, John Bortle, uh, <laughs> I was in a conversation with him and he's really intrigued by this and, and he wants me to see how many of the galaxies in Virgo I can see, <laughs> which I'm, I'm kind of intrigued by that too, because so far, like if I can find them, the bright um messy objects are findable i've gotten about six so far now mm. but it's just pointing the damn thing i just i really don't want to put a laser like i could put like a red dot on it but i just don't want to do that no, you want to stay true stay true to the instrument it's brutal and then there's uh he sketched the pallades so i've got to try and figure out how to sketch the pallades and then the moon because you can only you can really only get about a quarter of the moon in the eyepiece. Now you're missing I, one big part, Bill. You got to have your Galileo costume and hat on. <laughs> I do my my druidhood. Is that close? And no, <laughs> I've got I've got an observation jacket that's got like the big hood. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're I druid. figure that's that's pretty close. That's pretty close. Huh? You need to put a little V notch on the front of the scope and a pin at the back and and yeah, but, them around and find out. Yeah, but those are the things we those are the things we don't know how he pointed his scope. Yeah. Or or how he held it. Yeah. Those are the things that have been lost to time. He couldn't have just held it. No. You yeah, can't. Have I've, something. I've tried that. I've tried that and tried that, and it's just you cannot hold steady enough. 
because the field of view is so tiny. So small, yeah. It, it's barely bigger than the moons of Jupiter stretched out where you can get clear focus. Mm. Maybe you just stuck it on a stick, like a, you know, with a, a piece of willow with a V at the front. Well, I've got that great mount that Colin made. So it's actually on sort of this weird equatorial mount, yeah. but it's hard to point to yeah. get it. Once you get it, and if you've got it lined up pretty good, it's decent for tracking. You just have to nudge it a little bit. And you try so not actually, to lose it. <laughs> for doing the Pallades, it'll probably be pretty easy because I can just nudge it, nudge it, nudge it, and it'll stay. But that's the hard part is trying to figure out how he held it because that's kind of interesting. Because it's like F33 or F37 or something like that. Wow. So, But there's a lot of glare to Jupiter. If the moons are in tight, you can't see them. Because there was one there I could, when I went, I, I look at it and then I go back to like, you know, Stellarium or whatever to figure out where things are. And sometimes you can't see the ones that are in close or if the transparency is bad, then the dimmer ones don't show up. But you, you, you could probably imagine uh, Herschel standing at the top of his 20 foot step ladder and yelling at his wife to nudge the scope over. <laughs> oh, that's what it's like using Jack Newton's old scope out of Pearson. You're standing, you're standing at the top of an orchard ladder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, first Astro Cafe of October. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. As I mentioned, we have uh, Nathan, Margie, some photos from Edmonton, and David. Um, does anybody else have anything for us this evening? So if not, I guess, Nathan, if you're ready, you're up first. Nathan, are you ready? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, I, um, I've recently been going over some of my old pictures and seeing how I can make them look more interesting than they were just on their own. Um, so the one that I did this week was basically to take a picture of the night sky that had the Milky Way and a few galaxies and take away all the stars, which I got to say is not something that you can do quickly. <laughs> um, so you're left with just galaxies. Um, this was like another attempt to just feel small. When you don't see the stars and you just see the galaxies, you realize just how big space is. So anyway, um, I can show you this picture. No stars, just galaxies. Um, so just think, every single dot in this picture is not a star, but an entire PNG image that I inserted on top of this. Okay, this is not the actual picture. If it were act space were actually that dense, we would see them. This is what I imagined it would look like, but it did not look like that. Um, it actually looked a bit more like this. <laughs> Yeah, this is, a, this is our night sky with only galaxies. Um, I'm sure some of you could have gotten a lot more galaxies than this. Um, but anyway, basically here's the Milky Way. And then there's Andromeda here and Triangulum here. And then we have the Pinwheel Galaxy just over here. And other than that, I wasn't able to definitively locate any of the other galaxies, <laughs> so. His space is space is big. Space is empty. Um, I was kind of seeing if I could get that like um, Hubble deep field style image, but <laughs> no. <laughs> hmm. um, anyway, so yeah, that that is that's the picture I'm presenting. Hmm. Now, is this visual, Nathan, or is this at the visual scale, or or what? Um, this is just a uh, picture of the 
Yeah, so nice it'd be visually. That we took, and then I, okay, luckily I didn't have to manually remove every star individually. I was able to take large swaths out at a time, but I basically have taken all the stars out except for the middle band with the Milky Way and just left the galaxies that I could find. Cool, very cool. Thank you for showing us that. Margie, are you ready? I am. Uh, first thing is you may already know this because you read the um, Rask news. Um, the um, Isabel Williamson has been given a minor planet named a minor planet. Uh, her name has been used for a minor planet. The International Astron Astronomical Union's Working Group for Small Bodies Nomenclature recognizes the following Rask members in approving new names for minor, minor planets. So there were three of them, and Isabel Williamson is one. Minor planet I.K. Williamson recognizes Isabel K. Williamson. Nominated by Rask Montreal Center. Her citation reads Isabel K. Williamson, 1908 to 2000, won the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada's Chant Medal in 1948. Her observations of aurora and meteors were highly regarded by professional scientists. The first Messier Club was the result of her efforts. Rask Centers, here goes the teacup, Rusk Montreal Centers former observatory and current library were named in her honor. And second piece of interesting news is that I watched the Dava Sobel um, presentation. Thank you very much, Joe, which was fabulous. Oh my gosh, it was just fabulous. And she is fabulous. And I don't know whether you know that she has an asteroid named after her. 30935 David Sobel, De Deva Sobel, an asteroid, her own asteroid. And just as a side, as of 2017, didn't have an updated number. She has, she, as of 2017, she had seen nine total solar eclipses. And there will be more, I'm sure, in her life. All right, I'm going to share the screen. Okay. The Canadian women, woman astronomer I am speaking about this evening is Dr. Kim Venn. And all of you, or most of you, would know about her because she is ours. She is a UVic physics and astronomy professor. She has her BSc in physics and astronomy from U of T, 1987 and her PhD from the University of Texas uh, in Austin, 1994. She did her postdoc research at the Max Planck Institute for Astrophysics. She is a specialist in observational stellar spectroscopy, using stars to study the chemical evolution of galaxies and star clusters. She researches the chemodynamical analysis of stars in the galaxy and its nearby dwarf satellites. She is the director of UVic Astronomy Research Center and the program director for Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, NSERC, the CREATE training program on new technologies for Canadian observatories. CREATE is a program to improve the training and the mentoring environment for future Canadian researchers. 
uh, Kim is from Toronto originally, and she's about 56. I emailed her afterwards, and but I didn't ask her exact age. But that's approximate, approximately correct. In 2004, she was the Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics, Exploration and Understanding of Space. She has interacted with researchers at NRC Hertzberg and chaired or served on science advisory committees for Canadian and international observatories. She has an interest in new astronomical techniques, instruments, data, and analysis methods. Da sorry, data analysis methods. She has won numerous awards and she has 250 plus publications. She currently represents Canada uh, on the 30 meter telescope board of governors. Because there weren't any little tidbits of information about Kim on the internet, I emailed her and I asked her some questions. And here they are. I just received them at 6.15, so I haven't even read her answers yet. I asked her, how did you become interested in astronomy? She said, I loved physics and math early on, and my dad had a friend who was working on the Canada arm who would visit with a small telescope and show us things in the night sky when I was a teenager. So these things just went hand in hand. I asked her, what has most surprised you in your astronomy career so far? She said, the two biggest popular scientific, maybe there's a word missing, uh, have been, oh, uh, scientific, I guess, um, discoveries. Two biggest popular scientific discoveries have been the evidence for dark energy and the detections of so many exoplanets. But I personally have been really impressed by the Gaia mission, precise astronomy, and how it is revealing the actions and motions in the galaxy to us right now. I asked her, is there anything you'd like to say or predict about astronomy in the future? She said, I'll change the question a bit. Is there anything I'd like to happen in the astronomy community in the future? And that is that I would like to see more inclusion of indigenous knowledge and integration of the impact of science in society. I think it is unfortunate that science is not more fully appreciated or understood, especially during a pandemic that has a vaccination available for everyone and that Indigenous communities have not fully participated in scientific discovery and its impact on societies like they should. I truly hope that changes in the future, preferably in my lifetime. And so I am working to help make that happen. Listening, learning history, learning how to be an ally, learning protocol, reaching out, trying to stay open, and trying to share what I learn and who I meet with my colleagues. More suggestions, always welcome. Then I received a second email. One more answer, she said, about saying and predicting anything about astronomy in the future. I do believe that the next generation of large aperture telescopes will have an enormous impact, most likely finding Earth 2.0 or many Earth 2.0s. I think this could have a profound impact on how we view life, life here on Earth. She also answered again, biggest surprises. Also, the best thing about science is the discovery of things you don't know. The discovery of binary black holes from LIGO has just been amazing. We didn't even know those black holes were out there before, let alone be able to measure them. Now we know of hundreds of black holes that have masses between 10 and 100 solar masses. Whereas 10 years ago, we, know, we knew of none. Wow. That's it. Well done, Margie. And um, as you may have noticed in the announcement this uh, week, uh, Margie has... Um, uh, managed to get our next uh, speaker for us next time around. Maybe just remind us about that. 
say a few oh. words about, uh, about Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Kunamoto has agreed to speak to us uh, on October the 18th. So she will be here to talk about exoplanets and you can have your questions ready. She was delighted to be asked. So thank you for doing that for us. That's, uh, that's great. Yeah, it's very good. good. Great. Okay, I guess we're on to, uh, if Dave is ready, we have some um, Edmonton photos. Let me just get my PowerPoint ready here and share some right, screen. So while you're doing that, that, that yeah, most ahead. of these come from, from Arnold Rivera. Uh, and that was from October the 2nd and 3rd, so relatively recent stuff. Uh, the first one, though, is from Warren Finley. Um, Warren is a, a, a PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Alberta, and I, he's been a longtime member of the RISC in Edmonton. And he was one of the guys that started us building or getting ready to build the observatory out of Black Nugget Lake. Warren is famous for taking his foreground background shots of the night sky with, with interesting things in the foreground and background. So this one is a Halloween themed background of the Milky Way. Took that on September the 30th. And the rest are from Arnold Rivera. So the same October the 2nd, there was a bunch of guys went out to Blackfoot, which is if, for those of you who don't know Edmonton, Blackfoot is the dark sky area, which is east of Elk Island Park, about an hour east of Edmonton. And it, for the longest time, was our dark observing site until we started working out at uh, Black Nugget Lake, which is a little darker. When he was out there, uh, Arnold took a dark sky reading with the SQM meter. It was approximately 20.8. Now, I seem to recall it was a little better back when I was observing out there. So the encroachment of the city has probably started to decrease the darkness a bit. But 20.8 is pretty dark still for being close to the city. Uh, there are three guys out there. They decided uh, his target, or, uh, Arnold's target, was uh, Comet 4P Fay. And if you look on the right hand side, about two thirds of the way up, you'll see a little green spot. And that's the comet. It's magnitude 10.7, roughly. So he decided to. Uh, do a close-up image of it or a cropped image of it, and that's the next field of view. And uh, that's that's a 2.8 by 1.8 degree field, and it's is tiny, but this one's a little cropped, so you can see it makes a nice little green spot over there. So that was taken uh, with his uh, RSA8, Celestron RSA8, uh, and a ZWO camera. 480, uh, 480, 60 second subs, 46 minutes total uh, using deep sky stack and pics in sight. Then just for fun, he uh, took a picture of the next one, NGC 7293, also known as the Helix Nebula. Um, he says it's, it's bigger than the ring, uh, but because it, it's bigger, it's also, uh, surface brightness is, is lower. Uh, so he said Messier and Herschel's missed it when they were looking for dark sky stuff. But Carl Ludwig Harding found some, find it sometime in 1824. So it's been around, known for quite some time. Then also the, on, on October the 3rd, the same three guys were out at Blackfoot again. And what he what what uh, Arnold says is one of the things he likes to know, know before he goes out there to observe something or take a picture of it. He likes to know the size and the brightness of it. So they got piddling around trying to figure out could they get the Veil Nebula in a single field of view. So they used a ten inch daw with a forty millimeter eyepiece, and by gum. 2.8 by 1.8 degrees with his ZWO, he got this. But they were able to see it visually in a, a 10 inch daub. Uh, now I've got a 10 inch uh, daub, but I don't have a 40 millimeter eyepiece. <laughs> Best I have is 24 and you can only see a third of that at the time. 
So I thought that was a pretty decent image of, of the veil, considering how much part of the sky it has to cover. And that was it from Edmonton. Dave? Yeah. Um, what is the black kind of cross, the dark cross that's over on that left-hand side in the bottom? Do you see, do you see where I'm looking? It's, it's a, like it's a darkened area and it looks almost like a cross on the, yeah. on the left, on the dark and the left-hand yeah. side at the bottom. You know, this is in the, in just off the center of the Milky Way in, in Cygnus. And, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a fair bit of dark matter up there that's blocking out the stars in the Milky Way behind it. Okay. And I, I think a lot of what you're seeing in those black holes are not really black, black, uh, lack of stars i think it's it's filaments of dark matter of of dust of, and, of dust and yeah okay yeah, right. yeah. it's just it's interesting i just haven't i haven't noticed that before yeah. but i guess i haven't seen this as a as a large as one large yeah. picture before either i think you see that in some of the nebula as well where you'll see dark patches i think that's intervening dust mm -hmm. hey, thank you and it looks like from what he's saying, is this just a, this is a single shot, isn't it? He didn't indicate that it was. Uh, he didn't say what it was. Yeah. Yeah. He said an uncropped and uncropped image. So, so be a he probably did process it. Through a, is that through a, an eyepiece? That's that's through his RSA telescope. So that's that's. Oh, uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. That's where we're seeing with, something uh, like this. ZW. Yeah, that'll be a ZWO camera. And, and I, he didn't say specifically what the exposure oh. values were. But it would be a multiple exposure in there. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was wondering because he yeah. made it sound like that was bang. You just took this, and it's like wow. The, the nice, the <laughs> nicest I've ever seen parts of the veil again goes back to being on Kobo, uh, on top of Kobo with Barry Arnold's eighteen-inch scope, and he had an O3 filter, and we just cruised around the edges of that thing with that O3 filter, and it was in a two-inch eyepiece, and it was just fabulous. Mm. I've never seen it better since. cool object nice set of photos yeah well thank you for sharing this so i think um i think we're to david already <laughs> okay um i'm just going to give you my latest installment of uh trying to re rebuild a asi air pro but in a kind of a generic way so uh So you probably remember from last week, I talked a little bit about Astroberry server. Um, so basically, um, my goal was to try to replicate as much as I could. Now, the the beauty of the Astroberry server is that it's based on the Indie library. So that means that uh, the ASI Air is really predominantly for ZWO equipment outside of the digital SLRs that it uh, supports. Uh, but as far as other uh, CCD and CMOS cameras, uh, you're kind of out of luck. So with the Astroberry server, uh, which I believe uh, ASI, is, ASI Air is based on as well, uh, you have access to all the other manufacturers' uh, cameras. So um, I thought I would make it easy on myself. I started off with uh, uh, a Raspberry Pi. I added a power supply board to it so I could run it off of 12 volts. That works quite well. Uh, I actually patched it so it wouldn't run so hot. Um, for anybody who's ever uh, sort of run a Raspberry Pi 4, they run really hot. Like they're quite alarmingly hot actually. Uh, so they recently uh, provided a firmware patch that uh, kind of smooths out the heat a little bit. So it's not quite so hot. And I can definitely tell you it's not running as hot as it used to. So that was my first uh, hurdle. Uh, I thought it was going to be really easy because uh, the Astroberry server is actually available as just one package to install. Now, I waited and waited and waited and tried to download that distribution uh, with no luck. So uh, either it's really, really popular or the server is not doing very well right now. So I got a little bit frustrated because I thought, well, I wanted to see some results uh, soon. I didn't want to wait to get that distribution. So what I did... I actually went to the Indie library and I thought, 
well, I know how hard could it be, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it is kind of hard, but um, I thought, well, maybe I could do it from scratch. So the AstroBerry server uh, basically starts off as a build of the Linux uh, system, uh, a Raspbian system uh, put onto the Raspberry Pi. And then the Indie library is layered on top. And then uh, applications like PHD are layered on top again. So I thought, well, okay, if I can't have the whole shot, I'd at least get guiding. And in fact, that's really all I wanted. I just wanted the guiding for my track tracker. So I started off with just a, a Raspbian a Linux uh, build, which was really easy because you, you kind of just write that onto the micro SD card. And then the next thing I did was I layered the Indie library and that gave me access to all the other manufacturer device drivers. And then after that, I had to uh, actually rebuild PHD too. Uh, they don't really have any kind of um, uh, packages that you can run to just install PHD. So I had to download the source code uh, for PhD two, um, also I had to prepare the the Raspberry Pi uh, for the Git library as well because to access the code you have to run this other piece of software. Anyways, I, I went through all that, and uh, magically, I have PhD two running on my phone. So basically, I I can power up the the Astro the well my my uh, stripped down Raspberry server. Uh, I can run a remote desktop app on my phone. And actually, I have PhD too on my phone now. So I haven't actually tested it in reality, but it all works. Like I can launch the application and I can do all the settings that you normally would do for PhD too. So I'm just waiting for some clear sky. And hopefully I have a, a very small auto guider for my um, tracker without having to take the laptop out. So uh, I don't know if there's any questions about that. Um, certainly, if any of you guys want to sort of uh, follow suit and start building your own uh, server for that same purpose that I'm do doing it, just let me know. I can get you started. I'm not that far along. I'm only maybe another week week to do the rest, but uh, I've got at least auto guiding, I believe, working now. So it's possible to do. Uh, so let me know if you're interested. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the beginner SIG uh, is uh, on tomorrow evening. And I'm hoping everybody will uh, kind of share whatever observing experiences they've had since we last met and any questions they might have. And we're going to cover Cassiopeia tomorrow night as well. So well Dave, did, you get, did you get the camera on? Did I get the... Camera going with PhD? Did you connect? Uh, not yet, not yet. Okay. But I think it's it's going to be easy enough because uh, uh, Indy has uh, drivers for Attic, uh, ASI, all of them. Yeah. Uh, not a problem. Well, and I was... as... sorry. Yeah. So I the, the main thing was I wanted auto guiding. Now it isn't pulse guiding. It's SD4. So basically, it's on on camera guiding. So whatever guide camera you use. Uh, you have to um, uh, sort of uh, run a, an SD4 cable back to the mount. Yeah. Uh, it's not a pulse. Oh, actually, I did. I got the guide camera running through the Raspberry Pi. It's actually, it was actually giving me photons uh, on, on the <laughs> other end of the screen through my phone. <laughs> well, I'm just doing the same sort of thing. I'm putting uh, Indy on uh, Ubuntu on my nut. So. Okay, okay. Well, let's go. I'd watch your language a little bit there, David. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why Lots Raspberry Pi is better, right? <laughs> we'll trust that they're benign. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it was it was just I don't know. I was I was just dumbfounded when I saw PhD two on my phone. <laughs> it was really cool. Well, David, you certainly get the award for the hardest astronomy project I've ever heard of. Like, good grief. <laughs> yeah. I don't even know what half the words are you were talking about. David, when, yes. when you're using PhD2 on your phone, is your phone actually doing a remote desktop into the actual Raspberry Pi's interface? Yes. Okay. yes. Yeah, I'm not running it on the phone. Right. I, okay. I'm actually just, I'm, in fact, I'm using the Microsoft Remote Desktop iOS app, which, okay. which is kind of weird because 
uh, in order to use it, yeah. uh, the way they activate the mouse is you have to move with your finger, move the little cursor around. And once once you get it over the thing you want to select, then you do a tap. Wow. And that's how it works. I had to get used to that. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. But it's really fun to see it so miniaturized onto the phone. Hmm. It's it's usable. You can do it. Wow. Amazing. Well, that so, was yeah. all the uh, uh, um, topics we had for tonight. I don't know if anybody else has anything or if there's questions about anything you've heard. I have a question. Chris Gaynor is always doing something interesting, but you keep quiet all the time, Chris. Is there anything cool happening in your world these days? I was on national television today. Yeah, I was going to oh. ask you about that, Chris. Well, that's good. See, there was something cool happening. Okay, tell uh, us more. Well, I crawled out of bed this morning and there was an email uh, from Global Television asking me uh, what I thought about William Shatner going into space. So uh, so I, I was on the Global, the global News and uh, just pointing out how popular Star Trek is. Uh, uh, actually, I... Uh, uh, I really didn't get into space because of Star Trek or anything like that, but of course I did watch that show when I was younger. Um, but uh, a lot of people did. Uh, uh, and a few people who I don't know from space are, 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 are big Trekkies, one of them being the Premier of British Columbia. No so, way. So, uh, I don't know if that's... Uh, if, if, that speaks ill of uh, Star Trek or, or John Horgan, but anyway, the, that's uh, there you go. But I was actually the, the part they quoted on the on the uh, on the show uh, was me talking about how the model of the Enterprise is practically at, that's at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington is practically as uh, as um, uh, popular as say Apollo 11 or John Glenn's space castle or something and uh, this and I think I tipped off the reporter he didn't relate it to what I said but uh, I mentioned to him that the, the, the Russians are sending uh, an actress into space tomorrow um, and uh, and she's gonna do a, a they're gonna film her on board the International Space Station for some movie they're doing. Mm -hmm. So, is, so if anybody if anybody is uh, having trouble getting to bed tonight and, and uh, the skies are cloudy, um, it, we'll probably find live coverage of the launch going on somewhere. I think it's about quarter to two or something in the morning from mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Kazakhstan and. Since it's the it's practically the exact opposite side of the Earth from us, it'll be uh, it'll be in uh, daylight that launch. So mm. very interesting. So that's that's the uh, that's the latest thing I have to report on. I'm still waiting for my uh, my Hubble book to show up, but. Uh, but you know, I think we all are are learning more about patients than we cared to know during this uh, COVID business. Good deal. Um, I would I wouldn't mind bringing up one thing that I just would like to throw out to everybody, Please if I ahead. could. Um, uh, is there? Are, are there people that would be um, um, uh, interested in redoing the uh, uh, sky quality meter uh, map that we did back in, <laughs> what was it, 2010? I think, we, I think we got together. There were quite a few people, maybe about 20 or so. Um, yeah, it was 2010. 2010. Thank you, Jim. And we we made the map. And I'm and I'm thinking that um, like for two reasons is um, uh, I, I think it should be 
it should be updated because it's 11 years later. And the um, uh, friends of the DAO have put forward a an application to the um, uh, NSERC, for an NSERC grant um, to work on some kind of light pollution uh, light pollution activities with uh, with kids across Canada, and we'd like to have um, children um, doing some sky quality meter testing around Canada using just just like um, phone apps. Nothing nothing as um, as as good as using the uh, the the really the really good meters because they're too expensive to be able to send out to schools. But um, but to get to get some sort of um, uh, like we'd like to look at that, but if if we could redo our our um, our map again, I think that that would be a really a really good um, uh, exercise to do. It would take a it would take somebody to do the lead and to um, you know get everybody organized and and uh, and get as many of the of the um, of the sky quality meters <laughs> that everybody's got, I'm sure somewhere around. Um, if we could get that going, so I'm just I'm just pu putting it out as something that we um, that we could we could look at doing over the next uh, little while. Thanks. Yeah, I'm in favor of that. I think it'd be a good idea. I believe Sid coordinated it last time, so he probably would have the um, locations, the precise locations. I, actually, actually, I listed. have all the court. I actually have all the coordinates, Joe. Oh, I, you I do. The, oh, Craig, I, I, I did the original GIS map. Right. So, yeah, um, that's right. So I have the spreadsheet with all the coordinates. Oh, good. Do you yeah. remember what date of the year it was? Like what time of the year? Because it would be. I important. have to look at my notes. I have it would be was uh, late September. Yeah, it was okay. around this time. Yeah, around this I time. I participated, okay. and I, that was the year I joined. So. Yeah. yeah, and we did it as as like small groups or individually, yeah, or pairs. two people to it get pairs, pairs like went that. out. So it's not as though. Um, you know, we'd all have to get together. We could probably get with, uh, you know, do it again, you know, with just a, in a, in a small group and, uh, and see if we could um, get something going again. What kind of region are you talking about? We well, did. We covered, we all the way from the... Sip, uh, Sip to Sydney, basically. Yeah, basically. Part we did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's right. We could expand it, Dave, if you're interested. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> up the sure. island. <laughs> yeah, up island. Yeah. Except we don't have any past data. So that's the only thing. Oh. No. Well, no. then you start it, you know? Yeah. Expand it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You over you layer it like layer it over, right? So um anyway. and mapping uh, you know, online mapping systems have evolved greatly in the last 10 years. So we could uh much more easily publish it online now. Yeah, you know, there's lo there's lots of ways of doing it. I mean, I, I did it the easy way that I knew how then. I used uh, a product called QGIS from Germany, and it works quite well. I used uh, OpenStreetMap for the for the base. And um, yeah, it wasn't really that hard. I, I just uh, pulled all the coordinates, uh, put all the squim meeting. I actually coded where I stratified the readings so that I had them in bands. And then that's how I created the, the dots for the for the codes. <laughs> I like what Malcolm yeah, just did, the interferometry. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. And that's just yeah. the Victoria part, right? Yeah, they, they kind of map to uh, general bands that are associated with the SQM meter. So we have these maps, they're on our, if you go to our website under night lighting resources and scroll down, they're, they're down at the bottom. So there's the suit area, for example. Up to my chosen. I, I really think this would be very worthwhile. <clears throat> it's an 11 year baseline. I think we might be very discouraged at what we learned, but I think it would be really worth doing. Well, it'd be interesting to see the areas that really haven't changed all that much to see the impact of changing to LED lighting, for example. My numbers haven't changed. Yeah, I, I think you are lucky to live where you do. <laughs> and yeah. Pearson, at Pearson, it's actually gotten better. Wow. I can't figure that out. Hmm. Um, how many of you have got uh, a light meter already? 
Earth two. I ended up one when I bought Nelson's Three, with four, an extra with five, Nelson's stuff. Yeah. We'd probably need what about ten? I think Maybe. Uh, Dorothy, the club should, the Miles club should have, have one or two, I believe. Yeah, and Dorothy and Miles have have a pair, I think. Okay. Is and we that could actually use... used to do this? Like, what are you? What's the light meter you're referring to? Oh, uh, it's, it's QM. The yeah, QM. Uh, it's uh, made, yeah, made by on. unihedron. Yeah, if okay. you, if, uh, Brock, if you just go to uh, uh, unihedron, and uh, you'll you'll see the SQM meter there. They have different varieties. These are probably all wide field ones. I think most yeah, of us are using go. this one, right? Yep, that's the one I have. Yeah, okay. I have one of those too. Hmm. So, and this is a Canadian product too, just. To... Oh, really? Yeah. And I think they're about $150, something like that. Is that right? Yeah, what is their mm. price here? Yeah, they're pushing. Yeah, 155 155 US. okay. US. Yeah. Yeah, because they charge, oh, right. that annoys me a bit that they charge oh. things in US dollars, but anyway. It's like a couple of hundred dollars, basically. Yeah. Mind you, I think we could use the um, smartphone app um, if we calibrate the app to one of the meters. Yeah. Um, yeah, the dark sky meter oh. is the one that we're using, um, that we're going to be using with the with the students, so that the, yeah. the, the iPhone app, but I didn't know... Um, I, I didn't, I mean, we know that it's not probably quite as, um, uh, quite as accurate, um, possibly. We'd have to do some checking with it. Yeah, but we'd, it's, we, it's, we'd, we'd, probably, we'd probably have to isolate the values. I wouldn't want to muddy the, the, the data with, with a different tool again. Mm -hmm. uh, we should probably use the same ones if we can. Well, yeah, or, or as you say, well, or present, you know, certainly identify what was done with what tool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but the problem is when you map it, it the uh, data becomes indistinguishable yeah, from each yeah. each point. Well, so, or I do think, we, yeah, I think we need to stick with one instrument if possible. But if we can calibrate the app um, and it yeah. looks re reliable, we certainly could expand the measurements. Then, if we can prove that it's as accurate, yeah, and, and I, I don't think it will be, but you never know. <laughs> I was going to say, right. if we want to participate in the other one, we should have some phone readings as well so maybe yeah we, we could we could we could do both at the same time i mean we're going to be in the same place so just do two readings one with the phone and uh, yeah, one with the agent yeah. yeah is there um, a way go ahead Lauren. i was just going to say is there is there uh somebody just even online that kind of would like to take on a little bit of a covid project for the next couple of months and see what happens with this or um should we go back to sid or <laughs> Uh, or what should we do with this? Well, I think um, I think we should all maybe either contact you or Sid uh, as to interest, and then we should just count up to see what meters are available mm -hmm. in, in in the in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, could put out a little bit of a email to the group and see what people think. Okay, I don't really particularly want to take a lead on this but oh, I, I think we, it'd be nice if somebody did want to do that who maybe yeah. is already doing other things <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ah. so, yeah but so there are dots on that map but they're very large dots on a small map yeah they so, don't they don't really uh i mean the size be, of the symbology doesn't mean anything no yeah, but it's just knowing where exactly where to go oh i have the coordinates i have the exact oh. coordinates well, I worked with Joe, for example, so we had a list of places to go somewhere kind of somewhat closer together and some we had a couple of different regions of the city. So we just stop and do a series of readings in this spot and then move to this spot. And I think a lot of that was aggregated into a region. Right, David? Is that how you did yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. So yeah. if you, you gave just, me just west work from a map, Paul, you, you, you can have more detailed map would than I what just is do on. Them? Yeah, I have a way more detailed uh, map, actually. Then, that's just, that's just my the presentation. Then give me things west of Colwood, and I'll just do. Them. Yeah. So the other the other thing we could do is we could. Uh, you, you're right, Bill. We could uh, allocate this based on where you live, so that nobody has to go out of their way to do it. Because then you could run around on one night and quickly do it. Because then it'd be all the same conditions essentially. Yeah. So we did it over two nights, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. we didn't try to let too much time elapse. 
we don't want the the moon's gonna be the same, no? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You should you should do it the same night. That's what we tried to do. Yeah. Ideally. And and the same cloud conditions too, right? Yeah. Not and also uh, also a night with stable cloud conditions. Yeah. Well, clear. I hope. Clear. But, yeah, that's how we did it last time. Because yeah. <laughs> sometimes I, I a cloudy night can give a darker reading. Oh, of course it will. Yeah. Or poor transparency. Or or it can give a you know, how high the clouds are. I think it can give much. Uh, yeah. A really wacky reading. And I think we took uh, five readings at each location that uh, something like I, think, I, I, I think I've got the protocol written down somewhere, so I have the exact protocol. So hopefully we'll just do it the same way. Yeah. Maybe you could send that out to the RASC pick list anyway and see who bites. Okay. I'm in the dark about it. <laughs> Very good. The Nathan okay. pun. <laughs> yeah, giving Nathan a competition. It beat you, it beat you to it there, Nathan. <laughs> yeah, um, and if anybody here isn't on the Rask Vic email list, please let me know because you can be added very easily. And that's the main discussion list. Just a email membership at uh, victoria.rask.ca and I'll get you on there. So has anybody been observing? Did anybody do any observing since we last met? I haven't been out. Oh, okay. <laughs> but don't call me. I, I, other people observe way more than I do. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did take some pictures of Jupiter through the V of my tree. Oh, do you want to show us? No, I haven't done Oh, you have processed them. Okay. 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 okay, so you, you have to... Um, you have to uh, observe our image through a, a very small opening then. Well, I've got two small openings. It usually takes me the first small opening to, to get everything set up and then focus and, and everything. Then you wait. <laughs> then I wait for about an hour and then it goes to the next opening. Yeah. I think, I think in history there were uh, telescopes that were only designed to see one area of the sky. So people had to wait wait for their objects. That's sort of how I learned to sky before I figured out moving, leaving my property because I live in a hole in a forest. And so I'm very much, very, very much like, like the Leviathan where it was just, mm -hmm. I have the, had this window above me. And so as I viewed the Zenith as it went by, so I could spend a month and a half in an area and then a month and a half in an area and just try and find everything that I could that was in my atlas. So it, that was sort of how I learned the sky. Mm -hmm. And then there were some things that I realized, oh, gee, I'm going to have to go find a, a lower horizon or to the east or whatever. But it taught me just waiting. Okay. I'm not too anxious to observe things super early in the season. Oh, I have to observe Orion when it's skimming the horizon. It's like, yeah, wait two months. It'll be right above your head and perfect. That type of thing. Actually, I, I usually cheat because uh, the weather's nicer during uh, as you're moving towards fall. So I like to look at Orion then, but that means I have to get up really early. Um, but then I don't have to deal with the really cold weather. Yeah, that's yeah. good. I, I, I'm speaking of cheating. I'm uh, making use of the uh, SLU telescope in Chile. So I will share one, one project I've started. It's not really very uh, exciting at the moment, but it will get there. Eventually. So this is called the Unusual Nebula. It's in uh, the constellation of Norma, which is in the Southern Hemisphere, NGC 6164. And as you can see here, I only have, um, well, these six missions are to be run yet, so I don't have those to work with. So I only had six missions. So this is what I got from six missions. Um, That's cool. 
Yeah, it's a really cool um, um, explosion, I guess you'd call it, cosmic explosion. Uh, this is APOD's version, so you can see what I'm trying to achieve. I'd really like to get some of this outer mm -hmm. shell, which uh, there's no hope with uh, six 50-second exposures to get the shell yet. So you, you, don't have, you don't have the field of view either, right? You'd have to do a no, mosaic. I don't, well, no, that's a crop that I have right now, actually. Oh, okay. So I, I have a wider field of view, but you're right. It is a 14-inch Celestron I'm using, so it's not terribly wide. They call it a wide field, but I wouldn't. Um, but yeah, I should be able to get the shell uh, in the full frame, but I've got to get more integrations. So right. anyway, that was just... Uh, that's just a peek at uh, what I've been up to. Yeah, actually, Joe, Joe and I had a conversation off air about services in general, because I've actually been kind of looking for uh, data sets for photometry, not not for pictures, but uh, uh, actually to, to try out some photometry. And actually, I've completed my first half of the CCD course uh, from AAVSO. Uh, so I'm starting the second half uh, uh, this coming week, actually. Uh, so yeah, I've been kind of looking for uh, sources of, of data to practice with, um, but I did find some actually. I, I'll, maybe I'll post those at some point. Um, some of the larger institutions that collect uh, photometric data uh, give it away too. So uh, I guess what I'm also looking for is uh, easy data sets as well. Uh, things that have an outcome so that I know whether I did it right. I'm, I'm kind of just trying to practice workflow. So um, I'm trying to look for data sets that actually will result in something. Is there anybody else interested in photometry? I, I, I just found it so cool. I discovered this this year, um, just studying the, the variables. It's uh, it's really been a lot of fun. I, I, I didn't think it would be that much fun just looking at numbers, but it is. <laughs> It's on it's on my list, but it's just yeah so many things on my list. It's <laughs> yeah, I, I'm interested, but it's also where do I fit that in? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I, I like I, like I said. I I I find it really kind of weird that I just like to look at the numbers, but the numbers are kind of cool to look at when you mm -hmm. when you see that they move in certain directions or when yeah. they when they suddenly change. I mean, that is exciting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did take a picture the night before the last uh, session. I don't think I showed anyone, so I could share that. Yeah, please do. Managed to think. Can you guys see the Wizard Nebula? It's kind of there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Now. very wow. nice. So that was <laughs> taken on the. Uh, the, the night before, I guess it was the Sunday night, I think it was. This is, is probably it, is it, the last is this, clear night we actually had. Is this a 6200? Uh, on camera? Yeah, camera, yeah. 2600. Oh, sorry, 2600, okay. Yeah, it's a color, one shot color with that NBZ filter. Oh, very nice. So. That's beautiful, Brock. Yeah, Did you? Did, did you do any star reduction or is it that straight out of the camera? That's pretty much straight out. I did a little bit, but um, I didn't go too heavy on things. I just wanted to keep it as reasonably faithful to what came out of the camera. Mm. Yeah, no, it's what, good, what, it's very nice. What's the object, Brock? It's the Wizard Nebula. What's the, uh, just can't recall the, uh, NGC 7380, I think. It's very up. Very nice. Yeah, it's up not, I think it's near Cassiopeia, but I don't think it's necessarily in there, but. It's very cool. Hey, Brock, just to the left of center and above center a little bit, to the left of that, uh, those two stars, the orange one and the blue one, looks like a little chain in the shape of a U, an inverted U. Is that something special or is that just the way it turned out? Um, I'm not seeing it. Left, left, Chain. left. Oh, right I see. Right yeah, that. here. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. isn't it? I don't know. It's just, yeah, it's interesting. I it's see just, like stars like that all the time. 
Yeah, yeah they're not that unusual. Um, and, and, and I can never reconcile whether that's the way they were created or whether it's just well, I think it's it's human patterns. It's it's human pattern Humans recognition. Are really good at picking up patterns. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. what I think it is. Yeah. Because they don't look like that out in space, right? No. Just it, from a certain angle. Yeah. Right. You look at enough random things from enough directions, you'll start seeing various things. But, 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 but when you look at random dots, you often don't see them. So I, I I'm not saying it's a hundred percent one way or the other because i've lost, looked at random data lots and lots and lots of time and i don't see that and this yeah. is a visual object <laughs> <laughs> carolyn herschel discovered this object no oh, yeah. really so oh. she wouldn't have been using a big scope she didn't get to use the big scope it was probably like an eight or a ten inch scope, maybe twelve. <clears throat> right. And every time I every time I use the chili scope with SLU, I'm thanking the Herschels because uh, they camped out in South Africa for quite a long time yeah. to uh, see the southern hemisphere. And yeah, that was John, that was his son, John. Lucky was it his son. son? Pardon me. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's he, lots of Herschels. He, pa he packed up the scope after his dad died and moved it to South Africa. South Africa, wow. the big telescope. <laughs> That's yeah. quite an undertaking. Yeah. Brock, what was that object again, please? Uh, it's the Wizard Nebula, and that uh, was, I think, NGC 7380, maybe. OK, great. Thanks a lot. I don't have it in front of me now, but. That's OK. It's, it's in Cepheus. In Cepheus, so, OK. It's Cepheus. Right. Yeah. But it's been cloudy ever since. I haven't. I brought my telescope in. It, I, my telescope or my tripod, at least, has been sitting on my lawn since May, and it was kind of disheartening to carry it into the house last week. <laughs> what do you I, put I, it under? I hear you. I hear you. What do you cover it with, Brock? I've got a an Orion scope cloak. I think it's called. Or something. Okay. It's just covering the tripod. It's only rained like twice since May. Yeah. So up until that's worked months. well for it. I guess you, it's been fine out there. Yeah. yeah. Barbecue but covers. Leave it, leave it polar aligned and uh -huh. check it every couple of weeks. And makes it easy. Yes, we've had members using uh, barbecue covers. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, Chris, so is there anybody new I, that we did this last time? Uh, don't think I see any new names. We met Jeff. We met Jeff last time. Um, and Rich, did you say something? Uh, I've got a bit of Andy, eye candy. If anybody wants to see it. <laughs> oh no, no, that would be terrible. Please go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try sharing the screen, and uh, I'll do this and share the desktop and hopefully you can see me and put a preview. Uh, do you see anything there? Yeah. A rocket? Yep. Okay, this is uh, um, from Firefly Aerospace. They're trying, they're a smaller company that's trying to get into the um, aerospace industry and they've been hired to um, do some launches. Uh, this is their Alpha 2 rocket that's uh, capable of putting uh, a fairly hefty package into a low Earth orbit. And uh, this is the, this rocket uh, was launched on September 2nd uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And uh, I have a cousin from California who is up my way and he lives in Santa Barbara and he often goes up there to take pictures. So he took this picture of this rocket and see if I can go to the next one. And this rocket blew up. So, uh, and uh, on the website, they said, this is due to an anomaly. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> so so he, he took a sequence of these pictures and uh, they're quite spectacular. 
Wow. And uh, they, they picked it up. It was on the U.S. media, and it went viral for a while. Oh, so uh, he's got the whole sequence of it. And, and in, uh, in fact, um, he believes that uh, they found that the rocket was going off course a little bit, and they requested that they blow it up. But, uh, you know, they're pretty quiet about all of these things, so uh, you never really know. So uh, there you go. The price of the price of uh, the entry price into the aerospace industry must be huge. Yeah. So when you hear of some small company trying to break into it, you wonder. Well, that that rocket that was fifteen million dollars, according to the write up online there. So yeah. that was that was a bit of a bargain. <laughs> yeah. So, but the other people uh, who were expensive were, fireworks, though. <laughs> he, he was taking this picture, and the other people said, "Well, is there anything wrong? Is that just going on to its next stage?" Because part of it went up, and uh, it was pretty evident that there was a problem there. So, yeah. the publicly traded company, do you know? Uh, I believe so. What what's they what are they called? Firefly Aerospace. Firefly Aerospace. A fitting for the fitting name for that incident. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think I'll keep my money out of uh, out of anything like that. I think. I agree. <sighs> the rockets go up, but the price might not have. We could have a very good discussion about whether or not this is morally responsible, but we won't get there tonight. So. <laughs> yeah, the uh, this. This book uh, is about uh, the early days of SpaceX, sort of when they were in the same phase as, uh, as Firefly. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, uh, uh, Elon Musk practically lost his shirt on this company. And yeah. at, at the last, you know, he, he, you know, he was almost dirt poor because three or four launches in a row failed. And then, then, then they managed to turn it around, and it got a contract from NASA, and he's, you know, been, uh, uh, you know, kind of rolling in the bucks ever since. Yeah. Well, so, actually, uh, just to expand on that, Chris, he thought he was done, but at the last minute, he said, "Well, let's cobble together one more flight from spare parts we have sitting around," and lo and behold, it worked. Like good for him, you know. That's right. That's I right. So. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, there are, you know, he's, uh, he wouldn't necessarily be my, my choice to be stuck on a desert island with him or locked in a room or something. But, uh, uh, you know, he, he has really uh, put his, uh, put himself on the line for this, you know, which, which some of the other billionaires in the space race haven't had to do. He's a risk taker for sure, but he's a smart guy as well. Yeah. Interesting discussion sometime, Lori, over a beer or maybe two. <laughs> oh, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. I was going to say maybe wine. Wine. Well, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe not down in Tucson, though. Okay. <laughs> oh, dear. We'll see. Well, if we, if we get down things? there, we. If we get down there and we have a cloudy night, we'll have to sit around the fire and outside uh, solve all the world's problems. Solve all the world's <laughs> problems. Yeah, there we go. So, okay. All right. It's a $100 million I'm, company. I'm going to. So that's how much a $50 million rocket to go down. Uh, yeah. Anyways, well, if that's okay. it, I guess we can uh, wrap up for this evening. So thank you very much. Um, reminder that we um, next Monday is Thanksgiving, so we won't uh, be meeting. And then the week after that, we have um, Michelle Kinomoto uh, speaking to us um, as a guest speaker that night. So I think that's uh, what's on the agenda. We have, um, what do you say, a beginner's SIG tomorrow, David? Yeah, and I forgot, uh, there's uh, on Thursday is uh, EAA on Thursday as well. EAA on Thursday. Uh, that SIG as well. So two SIGs this week. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us this evening and uh, um, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night.